Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, welcome to the second panel of um, Quantify Annual Conference. Uh, first, I would like to ask you uh, not to judge us too harshly if you compare us with the first panel. They were talking about intelligence, and we definitely will not. Uh, they had really cool buzzwords, and all our buzzwords ends with uh, VA. But uh, nevertheless, um, we will talk about important things, uh, finding costs um, uh, for derivatives trading, um, and uh, in, uh, specifically about MVA and KVA. Uh, this is pretty much a work in progress. Um, it reminds me of a boy who uh, came to his father and asked uh, Daddy, um, how expensive is it uh, to be married? And the father answered, I don't know, I'm still paying. So banks are still paying, uh, and calculating the uh, funding costs is uh, pretty uh, uh, complex, pretty hard, and we have the perfect panel today to uh, talk about this and talk about some specific issues. Um, we have uh, Thomas Balzer, um, a head of counterparty risk trading and portfolio analytic uh, with RBC. Uh, then we have Gonzalo Garcia Kenny, uh, head of counterparty optimization and risk solution with Citi. And uh, last but not least, uh, Leon Michon, head of America's Global Evaluation Group methodology. And uh, today we will talk about two latest uh, VAs, uh, MVA and KVA. Uh, MVA uh, stands for uh, margin valuation adjustment, uh, but basically it relates only to initial margins. Um, I asked people where uh, variation margins went, and actually I didn't get clear answer. It just dropped off um, as a stepchild. So uh, now, basically, MVAs are only about initial margins, but that's that's plentiful um, uh, to talk about. And uh, uh, we'll start with Leon. And my question is: uh, Now that bilateral uh, trading also includes uh, initial margin, uh, similar to uh, clearing. Uh, why we still observe uh, some kind of basis and what basically your thoughts are in general about uh, IM and MVA. Yeah, Leon. Um, so uh, the industry has uh, the pricing across different CCPs is something that's been reflected uh, in uh, derivative transaction pricing. So the, the uh, recognition of uh, CCP basis across LCH and, and CME uh, largely driven by the gross up of the initial margin uh, funding cost and uh, uh, systemic imbalances between uh, different dealer exposures at the uh, various uh, clearing houses. Um, as banks try to optimize their uh, initial margin gross ups across the various CCPs, they also attempt to optimize their bilateral risk, uh, which is much more difficult to uh, to optimize and compress. Um, the exposures uh, tend to be somewhat directional. Um, it's very hard uh, facing a similar, uh, one particular counterparty to uh, balance that particular book and that IM gross up on the back of the UMR requirements of posting initial margin to that bilateral counterparty. And so what that has driven is a recognition that um, uh, executing swaps on a bilateral basis is costly. It has a initial, it has a uh, funding cost associated with that initial margin gross up, and um, and what dealers are starting to uh, recognize is that that cost needs to be compensated for. That cost needs to be recouped. Um, and uh, however, it's a very competitive market, and it's difficult in flow derivative space to uh, charge for that funding cost on a trade by trade basis. And I think what that has led to uh, ha is a recognition that exiting that bilateral exposure uh, may be more costly. It's more costly to optimize that, bi that uh, bilateral risk uh, facing your, um, uh, your non-cleared counterparties. And uh, firms have started to look at what is the cost to exit that exposure? What is the cost to maintain that exposure over time? Should we be reflecting that in our um, accounting statements, should we be attempting to uh, recoup that via incremental transaction pricing? And uh, it's a challenge that, that the industry is working through. Um, I think one of the things that uh, folks look at 
uh, is the, the volumes across the different counterparties um, and uh, you know, where they may be able to, um, uh, you know, what their expected uh, duration of that portfolio is facing that particular counterparty and uh, the type of activity that, that, uh, uh, that they typically see with that bilateral counterparty. Um, so you know the, the the pricing continues to evolve, and there continues to be a, a recognition uh, across the firms that uh, the IM funding cost is significant and likely growing uh, as we uh, enter the next phase of uh, of UMR. Uh, thank you, Leon. Uh, Thomas, um, as a head quant uh, for XV, so what are the main challenges for quantifying XV? It's um well, you want buzzwords, you can have buzzwords. <laughs> um, because there is a, there's a lot of, um, I think it depends. They, they, people take different approaches. I don't think there is like the, there's, there's the, um, the, one, the one solution that fits everybody. And, and people are looking at, at various, various approaches to it. And then it, it always depends on how sophisticated one wants to be. But in, in, in general, it's, um, you know, there's obviously a different type of margin, but, but um, not thinking about the CCPs, but more about the, uh, the regulatory driven margin where you have like, you know, everybody has agreed to, uh, to calculate initial margin based on the SIM. So then the question is, how do you, um, how do you predict what, a, what an engagement with the with counterparty under, under regulatory margin rules is going to cost you over the life of the trade? And that's where the, uh, the um, you know, if you want to be really advanced, people are saying you, you, you need to have your, your risk. You need to have your risk in a SIM framework. So ultimately, your, your initial margin is a function of, of, of all of your risks. And then you're going to do this. Um, over the future, you're going to predict what's your risk profile of this uh, of this counterparty over the future. Uh, you recalculate what your initial margin um, profile is, but that very clearly, if you if you wanted to do this by the um, by by the book, uh, leads to challenges like you know how do you how do you calculate your sensitivities at all points in time going forward over the over the duration of your portfolios, and this is when then um, you know those those who are geared up to do this throwing in um, things like algorithmic differentiations. Um, because you have to calculate a lot of a lot of sensitivities if that's what you actually, if if that's what you want to go with. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but I think everyone would agree that uh, MV is some significant number which banks would like to reduce. So we have uh, Gonzalo here who can comment uh, how to optimize the initial margin, how to optimize MV, how your desk basically addresses this. Uh, yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, first of all, we have to recognize that uh, that is a significant uh, burden or, or, or new cost for the whole industry. Some estimates are around hundreds of billions of new initial margin that someone needs to fund. Uh, so obviously that needs to be transferred into the profit and loss of institutions and eventually to clients. If an institution doesn't do that, and continues trading a product that is not profit making but profit reducing, that's the only institution that is going to end up trading that product. Uh, so obviously we need to price it correctly and that's why MBA is a buzzword. And um, at uh, different stages uh, or different phases of the initial margin, clients, not only financial institutions, are or are being uh, included in under the rule, right? So financial, big financial institutions are the first impacted because of the number uh, of trades and obviously the notional threshold that puts them un under the rule, but also clients. Uh, the impact to client, though, is already uh, when they trade with these financial institutions that, that are under the rule. Uh, so why do we have that problem? Uh, Leon mentioned it's much more complicated to optimize bilateral trades that are under the unclear margin rule versus a clearinghouse. And it is true, uh, when you have a product that clears, definitely you have only, you face only one institution, the clearinghouse, with its socialized risk. But otherwise, you are trading with different counterparties and clients on a bilateral basis. And for dealers, it's different now than a few years ago, a decade ago, I would say now. Uh, in the past, you receive uh, an order from a client. They want to buy or sell. You provide bid ask, trade with you. If this, the size is big, you were able to warehouse that for a few days, find the other side on an 
another client. But right now, you have less room to take those uh, somehow considered sometimes proprietary positions. So you end up turning around very quickly to the intra-broker market and hitching out most of the exposure that you receive, most of the transaction that you executed with the client. So you have, uh, at the end of the day, you've been long, short with many counterparties on a transaction that might, be, might have been originated by a client. So how do you optimize that? Uh, well, there are different techniques that we are using at the industry to reduce uh, uh, and allocate uh, and try to mimic the risk that you have at the clearing house. So if you have traded with kind of party A, B, and C, let's say you're long 100 million euro with A, and then 20, 20, and uh, 30 million short with counterparts B, C, and D, your net exposure, it's just 20, right? It's just 30, right? Uh, so what you need to do is execute trades that reduce the risk with the, or eliminate the three counterparties that are short and reduce the uh, exposure that you have with a counterparty that is long uh, by $70 million. So that's an example of what it's needed to be done. But this optimization is also exacerbated by the fact that uh, not all the risk is on the same venue. So if you trade products with optionality uh, and you're an options trader, let's say you trade swaptions, interest swaptions, you probably trade delta hedge, but your delta is at a clean house. And uh, the bilateral product, delta, vega, and gamma, is still there. So you have a significant cost on the new margin rule, right? The unclear margin rule will force you to calculate and pay or post the same number that Thomas was mentioning for delta, vega, and gamma. And in general, according to some uh, analysis, uh, the impact of delta is about 70%. Uh, so you need to try to move the risk where the product is. Right? Okay, thank you. Uh, before we move to our next VA, uh, can I ask uh, everyone uh, on the panel, uh, from your um, point of view, from or in your line of duty, what's the one most important issue with MVAs? So, Leon, can I ask you? So, with respect to MVA, um, uh, the most important issue for uh, for me and, and Bank of America and evaluation control function is to uh, try to understand if this MVA adjustment should be included in the bank's books and records. Now, uh, what we see uh, is that uh, most of the activity that incurs this initial margin funding cost is um, your high flow, high volume, uh, cleared or uh, bilateral swaps. And we could see the transaction price um, uh, there's a high degree of observability, and therefore, if we can observe the transaction price, then that must be the fair value. So adding an additional uh, MVA to uh, recognize the cost of the initial margin seems inconsistent with fair value. Now, what we had expected in the hypothesis um, uh, was that uh, with the additional funding costs, that are generated by the initial margin posting and the challenges with optimizing across venues and across bilateral, uh, we had anticipated that dealers would start to recoup that initial margin funding cost through a wider bid offer spreads. And it's something that we've been looking at closely but have been unable to observe uh, the widening of those bid offers over the last uh, you know, few years. Um, I will note that the data is, is very volatile and choppy, so it's hard to uh, really distinguish a, a, a pronounced trend or make much from that trend of bid offer data. But um, we, we haven't seen a, uh, as a widening, widening of the bid offer as we would expect. We continue to watch and observe the bid offers and anticipate that uh, as the next phase of UMR counterparties um, uh, we have to start posting to those counterparties and the initial margin costs explode, uh, then um, we do anticipate that uh, some uh, of that cost will uh, be attempted to be recouped by the industry through a widening of the bid offer. Oh, thank you, Leon. Uh, Thomas, from your point of view? Um, from my point of view, it's really a matter of, like, the, uh, there's, there's obviously the, the challenge as to how to price it, but um, more importantly is the, um, how are you, how are you consistent uh, 
with handling your initial margin across the whole spectrum of your of your VAs, uh, because initial initial margin is there for a reason, and and people might agree or disagree whether it's a good reason, but it is there to cover cover short term exposure, short term gap risk of of what can what can happen to the portfolio, and um, and that and so the initial margin, of course, uh, whilst you know, there's there's the MVA um, associated with it, which is the funding cost of, of posting into the uh, posting to to um, whoever whoever holds the um, well, yeah, whoever holds the margin. Um, it it offsets some other positions, and you have to make sure that you're not just uh, you're not just adding to the long list of VAs, but that you're consistently accounting for the fact that um, you know the the initial margin um, effectively turns. Um, Turns other risks that happen that that exists in the in the, in the broad spectrum of VAs into funding risk, whether it's uh, short-term exposure that is uh, that needs to be capitalized, or whether it's your uh, whether it's CVA with with margin period of risk, and you have to make sure that uh, you don't you don't just add another uh, another MVA to the books and records, but do, that you do this consistently, and and that you account for for MVA as um, you know turning some turning cost of, of of capital or credit risk that existed elsewhere before into funding costs. Oh, thank you. Uh, Gonzalo? Um, my first worry, uh, uh, to complement what has been said, uh, is preparedness uh, from the buy side for 2019 and 2020, uh, given that this is uh, new for, for the buy side. Uh, but if I have to pick up from Leon on what he said, um, we used to work together, by the way. <laughs> so there's some familiarity. Uh, so he, he passed me the ball to on something. Will we see an impact on bid asks in the future? Is do we expect that uh, the sell side is going to pass significant bid ask increase um, to clients? I I believe that there will be. Uh, who says significant, but there will be an impact in bid ask. And the reason is, uh, obviously, Thomas mentioned that you have some protection. So credit-wise, CBA-wise, you may think, OK, IM is there to protect you against the uh, market period of risk, right? The, that part, component of the CBA side. Uh, and that is fine. But that component is much, much smaller than the impact on the funding side uh, in terms of bid ask. You can take different studies, right? But that, that is the case. So you will have a significant amount of buy side end users, financial end users, uh, trading where the dealers will need to not just collect initial margin in most of the cases. Uh, uh, dealers and banks are already collecting initial margin. But now they have to post initial margin. And that translates into the funding cost that will be, in my prediction, impacting bid ask in the near future. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let's move now to KV, uh, which stands for uh, Capital Valuation Adjustment. Uh, capital, as we know, starts with C, but uh, because CVA was already grabbed by CVA, and as I know much, I believe, to Karl Marx does capital, so uh, we have it as KV, so, uh, and this is the cost of uh, funding for regulatory capital. Uh, so I will uh, ask Leon, uh, maybe you can introduce KV and um, um, talk to and um, share your thoughts about how KV is evaluated by banks and especially with respect to accounting. Sure. So um, the evolution of derivative valuation um, has uh, progressed, say, over the last 15 years, starting with uh, CVA and the recognition that you have uh, counterparty credit risk in your unsecured swaps, then to FEA um, when uh, post-credit crisis uh, the, the funding costs for uncollateralized derivative portfolio became much more significant. Many of the firms, um, uh, many of the banks uh, adopted in, in 2014, some in 2013. Uh, the next VA that uh, has been generating a lot of debate uh, is around capital. And capital um, and the 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 optimization and the use of capital has been a bigger and bigger focus for financial institutions as capital has become more scarce, as the requirement to hold capital has gone up. Um, therefore, their banks have recognized that uh, to execute very capital-intensive, uh, long-dated trades, 
uh, those institutions need to be compensated for essentially the opportunity cost of, of, of holding up that capital for a very uh, long period of time. Uh, therefore, in the last, uh, uh, you know, the last five years or so, uh, banks have bec become more sophisticated in how they price uh, KVA. Uh, which is the present value of, uh, you know, future capital uh, consumption. Um, the challenge with KVA is that it's very idiosyncratic and that uh, different firms are subject to different capital regimes. Different firms are subject to uh, different binding constraints. Um, so, you know, one firm may be uh, bound by SLR capital, another firm by, um, you know, B3 uh, B3A, B3S, and um, you know, given that idiosyncrasy of uh, the binding constraints and the capital requirements, and also the hurdle rates that each uh, institution is is targeting, uh, there's a wide diversity um, in uh, how different institutions think about and price KVA. Um, from an accounting standpoint, there continues to be a lot of debate around: Is KVA relevant for fair value? Um, given the diversity in, in, in practice and in, in valuing KVA from an execution pricing perspective, uh, it's very hard to estimate what a market KVA may be. Um, and it's also uh, difficult to, um, c to uh, consider the, if KVA is relevant for fair value to the extent that it may be more of a liquidation type adjustment. And that would be inconsistent with fair value, which is a going concern type context. Um, so there continues to be a lot of debate around KVA. There is a recognition across the street that, that KVA is priced into new unsecured derivative transactions. I think there's been a heightened focus from the regulators around how uh, firms uh, substantiate their day one P&L recognition and around how um, uh, firms uh, justify uh, uh, not including KVA in their fair value estimates. I think in some cases, firms have begun, begun to take uh, bespoke type valuation adjustments when they do observe a long dated capital intensive uh, transaction with a significant amount of day one P&L. But it continues to be an evolving uh, theme and it continues to be a theme that creates a lot of debate uh, across uh, practitioners around its appropriateness for fair value estimates. Uh, thank you, Len. Uh, uh, Gonzalo, as a user of uh, KVA, uh, are you satisfied how it's calculated? Um, do you think you, uh, it can be done better? Is uh, CT basically KVA ready? Can you comment on this? Well, I, I can comment um, uh, the same in line of what uh, Leon mentioned, really. Uh, it depends on where your constraint is. I, I wouldn't speak specifically about city, but I would think that uh, different institutions have different constraint, uh, constraints, and uh, uh, whatever is close to breaching that constraint, maybe targets of return on capital, and uh, there's a big trade that is long term or has a significant impact on capital, that is definitely going to be uh, priced, or that definitely is uh, priced. Um, I, I don't have a concern about the, the way it is translated. Uh, there are some rules on how to calculate capital. Uh, if that could be changed, that, that you know, is constantly evolving through different bustles. Uh, but uh, the way it's translated into the pricing, I think, is fine. OK, thank you. And uh, Thomas, can you uh, share your thoughts about uh, challenges of modeling KV, and uh, especially uh, maybe about the new um, uh, kind of BACVA coming and how this will affect KV calculation? Um, sure. I mean, KVA is is again. There's no. I don't think there's necessarily an agreed uh, an, an agreed approach as to how it is how it is calculated. And uh, on top of that, I think. If, if one talks about um, how you actually model your your capital requirements over time, then there is there's a lot of uncertainty about what can uh, what what can happen over over the, the course of a derivatives transaction. So uh, that's when I, th I think there is a lot of there's a lot of scope for false accuracy in that in that uh, in that spectrum, particularly where uh, you can be very accurate about um, you know about how you're predicting your your long term volatilities, and then at the end of the day you don't really know whether your counterpart is going to stay in the trade for five years or for thirty years. So that makes it all a little bit relative. But um, 
it's in um, I, I do think that KVA in particular from from an FRTB point of view so obviously uh, FRTB rules are going to come in um, whenever they're going to come in 2021 uh, with CVA being part of that where, where effectively CVA will uh, will be turned into a um, like in a, in a very simplified manner, just another market risk capital. So, so um, CVA will effectively be treated like like other market risk capitals. You don't you don't have an internal models approach, but you do have a um, a standardized approach, which then um, which which comes with its own set of challenges. So it it, it requires firms who want to adopt this uh, this standardized approach or the the SBA, the sensitivity based approach, to to calculate a lot of risk on their um, on their CVA, whilst at the same time it opens the uh, it opens the door to actually uh, very actively manage your capital down by by uh, by then you know doing the suitable uh, doing the suitable hedging, um, but again it is in in my mind it is very very similar to the to the challenges that an an MBA poses in that you are. Um, you have um, so you're ultimately in the business of predicting predicting sensitivities over long periods of time, and um, and and you know different people look at this uh, in in very very different ways. So so you can uh, you can say like it is impossible to calculate all those sens sensitivities simply because MVA in itself just doing the sensitivities on a present value is already challenging enough. If you think about actually wanting to calculate sensitivities on on CVA, which is like an order of uh, an order of complexity higher on that list. It, it becomes now an impossible, um, but there are. It's definitely an, um, a, a challenging proposition in, to do it properly. But um, but then I think there is a lot to be said about what what are the um, what are other aspects that you would actually want to want to capture. Is it is it really is it really the formula of of FRTB SBA capital that 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 you want to you want to capture? Do you want to capture? It may be more from like the spirit of what it's trying to achieve that it wants to, it it should it should uh, somewhat capture your tail risk on your CBA book as such, and then how do you um, how do you overlay over that kind of uh, that kind of um, theoretical modeling the the fact that um, the world is obviously moving to a more collateralized uh, collateralized state so. Um, treating treating a trade that is today unsecured as as unsecured over the entire life of the trade is maybe not the right thing to do, and 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 then it's it becomes becomes very subjective as to you know do you want to do you want to take the risk of of, of effectively punting that the trade gets collateralized after a particular period of time. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think we are slightly not yet encroaching on cocktail hour, but we still have time for several uh, questions. So. Back on the topic of MBA. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the actual process of how it works, uh, of, of how the required increase in price for businesses that are faced with these charges to be profitable goes? So specifically, is it everyone has these prices on their desktops right now and it's just a game of chicken to see who prices them in first? Or is, do you think that there'll be more coordinated top-down directives uh, of when these things actually appear on the screens of folks who are trading with your organizations? I think I can take that yeah. on the front office. <laughs> Good. Um, I cannot talk about my uh, company, in particular my bank, but I can uh, suggest an approach. Uh, I, uh, let me ask you a question first. I want to ask you, sorry. <laughs> Are you on the buy side or? Buy side, yes. OK, OK, right, right. So what you would expect normally, I would think, is definitely an impact on, on MBA on your bid ask. Uh, now, how is the desk going to be affected by that? How is a trader going to know? Well, you know, you, you run your calculation of this overall SIM model on a bilateral basis, how much your firm needs to post to the bank on a segregated custodian, and how much the bank needs to post to you on, also on a segregated custodian account, right? Uh, that has an impact. Uh, any new trade could be positive or negative. Could be a risk-reducing trade, because the model is risk-based. But let's assume that it's a risk increasing. If trades are not bigger than a certain amount, you probably have a shortcut method. You don't need to go through the, over the whole rebatch of calculation, the whole scene for every single trade. Uh, you have a shortcut method that maybe uh, only for the exposures that that desk has, business has. Uh, and it should be a very crude but close approximation for a small trade. If you have a big trade, then you will need like, to double check we, and maybe run a little more of a revalue of that sim 
uh, it wouldn't tell, take that much anyway. It's, uh, if you are bringing a big trade, anyway, a trader will always say, okay, let me see my liquidity, give me two minutes, or can I, can I call you back? So that, that would not be a problem. And, and typically a big, big volume trade, you're not, uh, unless you need an urgent answer, but in a period of very high volatility, you, you, you would not be executing, you would not be able to execute. Some, some trader would tell you, I'll take 10, let me work on 90. Right or something like that, but if low vol normal business day, they would tell you, okay, the size is big. Let me call you back or let me let me do some calculations. Maybe more automated or less automated, but it will take a little bit of time. Not a lot. Right? It's not the following day. Do you see the bid ask spread uh, moving between IMM and non IMM banks on the KVA side? Just your observ observance from the markets. Myself? Um, no, no, not really. I think that KVA uh, uh, capital charges is a constraint that has a different, a different impact. Uh, it depends on the financial institution and the particular business that you're dealing with. Some businesses are very sensitive to balance sheets, some other ones SLR, RWA. So if you are very sensitive to one of those, and your business becomes, or desk, become less profitable if you increase certain types of trades, you reduce return on capital for your institution, then there you see a charge, but it's not that, that uniform. I don't think that that's a material impact in BDASKs at the moment. Hi, this is Hans Chung from Morgan Stanley. Um, so I, I, I think uh, initially, Thomas, you mentioned consistency of approach when implementing MVA. Um, and if we think of MVA as so, a sort of FVA on I posted on these uh, new SIM trades, do you think that um, if or when we ever go live with MVA, that something similar will have to be done for FVA on IA posted with CCPs? Or is there any kind of connection? I personally think yes. Yes, so that, because, um, well, when, when I think of, of MVA, it really has like three aspects to it. One is the CCPs, one is um, regulatory margin, and then there is bilaterally agreed um, bilaterally agreed margins that is is written in the docs as as uh, you know predating the, uh, the the regulatory margin rules so I, I I don't see any reason why they should be treated any differently um, because at the end of the day it's it is uh, it's kind of money out of the door that attracts a funding cost and if, if you want to if you want to account for one then I, I don't know why why any any of the others would be exempt but uh, maybe that maybe maybe there's disagreement but that's how I see it I guess from, from a fair value perspective, if you can observe the price, then that price is the exit price, that's the fair value. Uh, taking the incremental adjustment for the cost of the initial margin would uh, be inconsistent with the, the trading activity and the pricing that you're seeing in the market. I think um, the, the calculation of, of MVA uh, at this point is very helpful for firms to help understand the impact of incremental activity. It's very helpful to understand um, and assist with allocating that funding cost to the various businesses. I think, I think firms are still trying to figure out how to set the right incentive structures and transfer pricing of that initial margin funding cost to not only ensure that um, uh, new activity that's adding risk uh, the firms are uh, appropriately compensated for, or, or at least before the trade is executed, people are aware of that incremental cost. But also, um, firms, I believe, are trying to figure out how do you set the right incentive structure to compensate for activity that is risk reducing. And, and that should, um, in theory, be passed on to the clients um, and try to incentivize and steer directional business um, you know, where it is risk reducing. And I think um, it's still something that uh, firms are trying to grapple with, but uh, the calculation of MVA certainly uh, greatly helps with uh, that uh, problem. Okay. Uh, I can I, mention the uh, following. Sure. <laughs> so I, I think I agree, uh, fully agree. Uh, it, it helps and it sends the right incentives into the right place. The industry <laughs> is trying to grapple with that because clients, may want to uh, be very efficient in their trading and the risk. And uh, they probably got the best bid as with one dealer, but the risk is on the other dealer, so they want to 
allocated there, uh, novated, or do some type of assignment. When you assign that trade to the other dealer, you may have a problem that there is a CVA slash MBA or FVA associated with the trade with this particular dealer. And it's not a, a, a matter of transferring the, the risk directly, and the, it's the, it has the same value for, for both dealers. You may have a problem, and if you're on the buy side, you probably had already that problem, even with CVA only, that someone said, yeah, I'll accept that, but this is a charge. And uh, that is what we are trying to grapple across the industry, how to communicate with our clients and investors. Okay, I'm glad we all agreed on the panel on everything, right? There were no <laughs> really debates. So let me, um, on this note, uh, finish and uh, thanks our panelists, right? So for. <laughs> <laughs>